This is Eric Jackson. It's my pleasure to welcome Dominique Eid into our studio. Dominique is a longtime member of the Boston jazz community, longtime faculty member at New England Conservatory, and we're fortunate to have Dominique in the studio to talk to it, with us today. Dominique, how are you doing? Doing great, Eric. Good. I'm Good. so happy to be here Good. and always so happy to see you. Good. Always happy to see you, too. Um, well, I started off talking about uh, you as a longtime singer and longtime faculty member. Let's let's jump on the faculty side sure. first. How long have you been uh -oh. <laughs> at uh, New England Conservatory? A really long time, yeah, decades. Yeah. Um, yes. And I was trying to count the years. I am not exactly sure, but it's thirty-six, seven. Really? Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Right, right. So it's been. Um, it's been an amazing place to be, an amazing home. I was there as a student finishing right. my undergraduate degree. I also did my artist diploma there, actually while I was on faculty. Um, and it's just an incredible, incredible institution, incre incredibly run, and amazing, amazing people that come through there, both on faculty and students. So I've loved every minute of it. You, you made some sort of distinction. You said an artist diploma. What was the other thing you were doing? So I did my undergraduate degree. I finished it there. I had begun actually as an English major at Vassar. Oh, um, oh yes, yes, I remember that. I do remember that. <laughs> and I yeah. realized, um, with the help of a really, really um, uh, surgically insightful uh, English professor, that I was actually a musician. So I came. Really? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, uh, Miss McGrew from from Vassar. We all loved and feared her, and uh, <laughs> I wrote a piece of music for one of the. In, in addition, I, I didn't not write the paper, but in addition to the paper, I wrote a, a piece of music for a, um, analytical writing on, on Shakespeare. And she t t went over and said, let's go to the music building and play this for me. And it, it was sound a little, it was for, for Midsummer Night's Dream, had a little monkish quality to mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. she just said to me, you know, you're a good writer. You're an extremely passionate person. And I've just been wondering, where is this passion? That's where it is. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's Isn't fascinating. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> just is. one of those moments. And of course, you know, they say the truth will tick you off. Yeah, you know, yeah, they, yeah. they say, tick you off, and then set you free. And that was it. I felt, I mean, I had always played music, and but it, it was so close to my heart, I never thought of it as a vocation. It was just what I had to do. Right, right, um, yeah. And the minute she said that, I mean, of course, I wanted to be a good writer because I admired her so much. Um, but then I was like, oh yeah, okay. Um, so I so I took a leave of absence and I got my reading and writing skills together at Berkeley um, because I mean I could read, but I was like, you know, not I was analyzing Beethoven sonatas, but it was painful, you know. So I wanted to really get my my skills together, and I did that. And then I heard Rand Blake play mm -hmm. at Jonathan Swift's, and of course he was on faculty um, in the then Third Stream department right, at right. NEC, and I said. Right. Yeah. That. Now, uh, why did you go to Berkeley to start off with and, and not the conservatory? I didn't know about the conservatory. Oh. This is the perennial PR problem for okay. the conservatory, the okay. hidden treasure of Boston, the, okay. New, the New England Conservatory, right. that is. Right. Right. So, um, but also, I came really just to do the summer session. Um, I was in a band at Vassar called Naima. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. um, the great bass player, my dear friend Ed Bear, um, was the bass player. And we both were like, okay, we need to go further with this jazz thing. And so we came to do the summer session at Berkeley. And that's when I decided, okay, I could learn a lot here. And I took the leave of absence from Vassar thinking I might return. Um, but that completely changed when I heard Rand Blake and decided then to go down the street to New England Conservatory and finish my undergraduate okay. degree. And so you've been working off and on with Rand Blake for all of those Since years? Since then, right. yeah. Right. Since yeah. then, I, we, um, I think my freshman, well, my first year there, I wasn't a freshman because I had already gone to college for a couple of years, but we played together in September. Um, we played a version of Laura and Jordan Hall. Yeah. So since that, whatever year that was, he, he must have he must have uh, played the album where he did Laura with uh, Gene oh, Lee gosh, too. Right? Yes, because yes, yes. he played it for me exactly. too. Exactly. <laughs> no, and I think I already already knew it. Oh, you okay. know, I think uh -huh. that you know, I knew his work. That's why I ended up at Jonathan Swift's. But there was just something so 
you know, like when you find a writer who, who's just saying what you need to hear, you know, there was something so um, profound in his music to me that um, I went right in that direction, and we did. We, you know, I studied with him, but we also played together quite a bit. We had the quintet with Ricky Ford. We did some duo stuff. Um, we never recorded until quite a bit later, um, just for reasons of circumstances. But uh -huh. it's been a long, really long and wonderful association. Now, you use the term, uh, I think, something like so-called third stream. OK, first tell us what third stream <laughs> is. And what is that department now? Right. Called? So it wasn't so much so-called, but it was called that at the time. Right, it right. isn't yeah, now. I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. Third stream is a confusing term. <laughs> I think Gunther Schuller, who is is the person who is supposedly coined the phrase, yeah. um, according to his son George, anyway, that he meant it more as a um, verb than a noun. So it was really never meant to define a genre. You don't have to have, you know six ounces of mango and, you know, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> two ounces of yogurt or whatever to make this right. third thing, you know, whatever, classical and jazz. It wasn't like a recipe, a specific blend, but it was a concept of being able to cross over the boundaries of genre. Um, and, and I think Gunther Schuller's vision really was to try to educate, um, because he was started the jazz department in right. at NEC, at New England Conservatory, he wanted to be able to educate musicians who would have equal skill in classical music and improvised music. Mm -hmm. um, but because it became something a little bit more rigid, like I said, this recipe, it's got to be, you know, this much classical, this much right. jazz, right. or this portion of jazz, um, that kind of became outdated in a way because it was something people were doing. Um, anyway, but it also became somewhat problematic. Um, oh, well, kind of in ways I don't know whether it's really been, has evolved as much as it could have, but you know, if you think of some of those early recordings with, with Gunther and with Eric Dolphy and, and, and Ornette, I mean, it's amazing to hear those people play in that situation, but you couldn't really say they're fully integrated into the classical setting um, and and maybe it's a problem of education like you know even I know I did a thing with Stan Getz and orchestra um, at New England Conservatory and it was very difficult to like with the rhythm section I think it was Lewis Nash and um, and Dave Holland it was really difficult to sync the feeling swing feeling and the strings uh, between the rhythm section uh, okay. so yeah. there's these there, yeah. there are these yeah. um, not that one is better or, 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 or worse, but there are deep things about each genre that if you strip them away, um, you might not be left with the, the really essential things in right, that. Right. Not that we can't, but I think we, it's, it's a lot to catch up with. But I also think people's composition styles have become more complicated, even in jazz, to um, encompass some of the vision that maybe Gunther did have. Um, so third stream became problematic because it seemed outdated, sometimes a little bit outdated, and also limited in terms of why are we thinking genre at all if we're trying to put these genres together? Why don't we just go outside the box and make music? Um, well, we we have marketing to deal with. That's one reason. That's very why. true. Oh, yeah, <laughs> oh, they, oh yes, <laughs> that's exactly right. But even from a marketing standpoint, I don't think it was a selling term okay. after a while. Uh -huh. um, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it was an incubator, really, like if you think of the modern jazz quartet and, you know, all that music and Jimmy Jufri and many, many people who were, you know, within the perimeter of that idea. Um, but it became kind of date, dated in a way. Um, so ever since then, the department, which is separate from the jazz department right. at, New, right. at New England Conservatory, has been in search of a, of a proper name. Um, and right now it's called Contemporary Improvisation, which... Um, Brings is, problems because yeah, yeah. <laughs> this other stuff they call jazz is contemporary That's improvisation. That's exactly right, yeah. yeah. So, so it, and it's kind of meaningless and, and doesn't really... So we're searching. So if you have any good ideas, uh, anybody out there... Oh, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. <laughs> oh, but, but the difference is that the, the third, so-called third stream now... I did say so-called, you're right. Um, uh, 
CI department, contemporary improvisation department, is not genre specific. So you could be studying Indian modal improvisation or Persian right. music along with Appalachian folk songs and jazz and, you know, from, you know, early jazz to Ornette Coleman. But we overlap. The two departments, even in faculty, um, do overlap quite a bit. I think I learned from uh, Ran early on when he started working with a Greek singer. Eleni Odani. Uh, okay, is yes, that who I can't, yeah. couldn't remember the Wonderful name. Wonderful singer, right. yeah. And that's when I started getting, a, I think, a better understanding of what, even what Third Stream was supposed to right. be. Right. Uh, you know, because before I used to very simplistically say, well, you have jazz, you have classical, and the two come together and they f make a third stream. Right. But then I, I guess I got to a point where I said, you have this kind of music, you have this kind of music, and then you get a third kind of music. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think the idea, you know, with, with um, Gunther's son, George, saying that it's not a noun, that you know, that you don't want to have something that you're just left with that is this thing, but it's really a way of co collaborating in music, I think, so that you don't feel you have to adhere to certain genres, but that you can come from, you, you know, the language you speak or the, or the tradition of music that you're in and collaborate with other people, even if they're not in that, right. trained in that right. genre specifically. Right. Right. Um, so then it doesn't, but it, I think originally it really was classical jazz and this other combination, you know, streaming these two together to see what happens. So, so now that we've said all of this, does Dominique E teach in the <laughs> contemporary improvisation department or the jazz I department? I do both. Oh, okay. Yeah, I okay. do both. So I went to the um, third stream department because I loved Rand and also because I knew Rand loved singers. And at the time, the jazz department did not, at New England Conservatory, did not have much to offer in terms of a, um, training for vocalists. Mm. I mean, you could study with, if they would take you, which not everybody would, a classical teacher. Geraldine Martin was a wonderful teacher that was there for private lessons who was classically trained but also knew musical theater and some other things. But there really were no um, ways in which the singers, and there really were only, I think there was one when I started there, um, were integrated into ensembles and so forth. People just hadn't um, figured out how to do that and yeah. how to value that in jazz education. There's a little bit of a sense that, um, at least in jazz, really in jazz education, that the two things are very, are, are very different. There's the vocal jazz and there's the... Well, there's got to be some similarities. Oh, yes. <laughs> How you sing the C is the same in whatever kind well, of music you also, sing. I mean, if you think of, you know, Louis Armstrong, trumpet right. player, band leader, right. singer, right. Yeah. improviser, right. scat singer, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. so in a way, there was just a little bit of, I, 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 you know, I don't really have an explanation for it, but but it's still true. I mean, there are quite a few jazz programs in schools, you know, uh, universities, colleges around the United States that don't have a vocal program because yeah. they don't know what to do. And some of them do something where they really do uh, focus on vocal jazz group singing, you know, right. so that yeah. would yes. be, yes. you know, um, yeah. uh, Frost in, in Miami and Western Michigan. And so, so that can be a really big thing as well. Um, but at New England Conservatory, I was able, you know, to join the faculty shortly after I graduated, um, and I did teach for the third stream department, it was still called that then, but I taught whatever jazz singers were coming along there, and I've been able over all of these decades to develop the, it's not a separate program, but to, to develop the, the um, vocal program within the jazz program to something that's been quite um, rewarding and we've had some amazing, amazing, remarkable students, um, many of whom I'm sure you play on your show. Sure, Thank sure, you for that. Sure. <laughs> um, it, it, do you think there's a, uh, and I'll get back to that in yeah. a few minutes, but do you think there's a, a bias in some of those schools against jazz vocalists? That I, I, I'm reminded of something, yeah. you, you, you may know my father sometimes used to do my show with me. Oh, and right. I, and I, yeah. you know, there were times when we would be playing some things by vocalists, yeah. and then he would say, let's get back to some jazz now. Very interesting. And I would, yeah. you know, it sort of right. took me back because I didn't, I didn't make that separation. Sure. So do you think maybe these schools have a kind of bias now too, that 
Jazz is what instrumentalists do and singing is what vocalists do? I think that is part of it and I think, um, I mean it's complicated, but I think that is definitely part of it. I mean remember Tower Records had the vocal department, oh, right, 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 a little right, small right, little room that right, was separate, right. you know, where, I don't know, my record would be next to Edie Gourmet or right, you know, right. somebody I really didn't feel I had that much in right, common right, with. Right. Um, she's great, Edie's great, no, but... <laughs> <laughs> Her relatives are listening. <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, I was more interested in, you know, Miles Davis right, and, you know, right. Thelonious Monk and Duke Ellington. Yeah. So I think it's complicated in the history of jazz. I think, for one thing, when there's vocal vocals to music, generally the potential for that music to reach a broader audience is greater, right? So that can give it the tinge of something popular rather than yeah, yeah, um, okay. than the real aesthetic okay. jazz, right? Okay. But also there's been different eras in which jazz is popular, so popular singers can sing jazz. So it gets complicated. But the thing I think we really miss is that, um, well, this is really kind of technical, but, but there's this thing now called the I Real Book, um, which is the way people go to find chord changes to right. be able to play, uh -huh. you know, Stella by Starlight. But they should have that memorized. But there's no melody. <laughs> there's not only not lyrics now, there's no melody there. Um, so this emphasis away from the... So the are you saying the I real? I know the real book and I know the fake book. The real book <laughs> has the melody. But the I real book, which is on your phone, which if I, you know, am saying to my students, you know, let's do this song, I see them or at least scrolling, right. you know, what is uh -huh. come rain or come shine, you uh -huh. know, what are the chord changes. But they're going to find the chord changes, they're not going to find the, even the melody. Wow. So, uh, I'm so, thinking, you actually could come up with a whole new song, because you just have the chord changes, well, right. and you can it's easily say, well, okay, we're going to... It's to improvise on. Right, right. yes, yes. But, but, and, and of course, people do, and write different melodies to, sure. to standards, and sure. all of that is great, but my point is that... Um, Older players that I play with, you know, if I'm playing with Billy Hart, he's not that much older than me, but we're old, we're older, right? If I'm singing a song, I'll turn around and he's, he's mouthing he's, the words. He's a few years older. Yeah, just a little. <laughs> you know, but he came up playing with Shirley Horn, so right. he knows all those words and he cares sure. about sure. it. And, you know, the, the, the vocal part of jazz has carried an essential part of the music so much you know, so much so that at some points when people weren't allowed to have instruments, you know, the voice had to carry everything. Right, right, so I right. think that when we get away from the voice and from the sound of words and the meaning of words and melody, um, we really obviously lose this really, really vital part of jazz that I think now in music schools, I mean, certainly at Newman Conservatory, instrumentalists are hungry for. I mean, lots of instrumentalists come and study with me, um, both to emphasize learning things by ear, being able to sing things rather than just being able to put their hands on them and know, you know, there's this kind of, you know, altered scale, and I know it because it's factual. I want to know it because I know the sound of it. Um, so, um, so it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'll say, There's probably a bit of sexism in there, too. We could parse that out. Um, that affects male singers, too, you know, so it's not just affecting female singers. But, but um, there's a... Um, when, so when I started at Berkeley, I was one of very few women in the student sure, body, sure, and which was kind right. of kooky to go from right. Vassar, where I was... Right, right, yeah. But, you know, yeah. there were very few men integrated in, you know, at that point. But... Um, Nobody told me Blossom Deary played piano. Nobody told me Sarah Vaughan played piano. Um, nobody, I mean, really, people were just like, oh, yeah, Chet Baker's great because he's a trumpet player. There was just this, like, the, the, the legacy of these incredible jazz vocalists. Um, not that they have to play piano to be great, but, but, you know, if I could play a chord or sing a chord change, people are like, oh, wow, that's amazing, you hear chord changes. But that's part of, that's right. basic, right. you right. know. Right. So yeah. there was this weird um, uh, denial, really, of the 
of what had been accomplished by generations prior. And there were lots of, you know, um, you know, actually, uh, if you, if you, if you um, look at some old books written about jazz, you know, there, there are definitely some memes, we would call them today, about vocalists, you know, but, right, right, yeah. but nobody questioned. I mean, Sarah Vaughan played piano and, you know, subbing for Earl Hines well, and, you know. They used to say she was like one of the guys. Right, but she wasn't <laughs> that unusual. You know, that was my, that's sure. my point, right. you know. Carmen McRae played beautiful sure, piano. Sure, sure. Anita O'Day supposedly played great drums. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And, and even, you know, people, you know, somebody like Bessie Smith or, or, um, or, um, or Mamie Smith, you know, supposedly had great ear for instrumentalists and could put amazing bands together. You know, so so there hasn't been this great divide. That's what I'm trying okay. to say. That it's somewhat due to marketing and maybe some other issues, mm -hmm. societal issues um, that tend to regard people with with a certain with a certain slant. You know, something I, that I uh, and this comes out of what we were just talking about. Uh, a few years ago, I heard you at the Museum of African American History. Oh, yeah. And you performed a cappella, three songs. Yeah. I think it was two or three songs. And I just, I absolutely loved it. Thank you. Because I said, you know, there, I think there are a lot of singers who would have gone off key. Oh. I don't know, they could do three <laughs> songs and you not go, ouch once or twice. Right. I didn't go out at all so when, when you sang, which speaks to your sense of harmony, melody, mm. uh, intonation, whatever, whatever uh, too. Um, do, you, do you play an instrument? I do. I you do. do. Yeah. I play, I mean, I came up kind of more as a singer-songwriter, so I played guitar by ear, and so I've definitely done a lot of ear training, you know, unofficially and then officially in music school. Um, and I do play piano, and when I write, I'm often using the piano um, compositionally, and I accompany my students. I don't perform on piano. But, mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting, because the solo thing, um, I, I'm really inspired by a couple people that you might not expect. One would be Steve Lacey, the oh, wonderful oh, soprano sure, player, who's, sure, who just had sure. this very rooted sensibility when he would play solo. Um, and then Jackie Byard, okay, well, which is yeah, a yeah. kind of interesting sure, thing. Sure. Because when I was, was hungry to do some stuff just all by myself, there is this feeling like, oh, well, I should be... You know, singing the bass line and then doing something over here and trying to cover all the instruments. That's one kind of pitfall or, or thing I didn't wrote I didn't want to do, like pretend I'm other instruments all in beatbox and right. so forth and okay. so on. Right. Exclusively. I mean, I could throw those sounds in, but I didn't want to feel like I had to keep all of those things going. Um, and the other thing is that I um, didn't want to add, I didn't want to. Maybe I'm just too lazy and old <laughs> to learn the looping pedals and all those things. But I feel like the learning curve for that is really, you know, it's pretty boring until you get really good at it. I mean, somebody like Theo Blackman, who's amazing, amazing, you know, has worked so, so hard. Actually, I was at his first gig when he was dead, and he's worked really hard and can oh, really, be uh, really seamless and amazing sounds. But I didn't want to, I just sort of felt like, we can hear a storyteller, so the human voice should be enough. Um, and then I thought about Jackie Byard and how he story told at the piano. If you went, to, you know, as we were lucky enough to hear him play solo piano, that he would ramble a bit, get you know, get a bit into this, this sound, this thing. Then you go, oh, is it going to be, yeah, you uh, know, yeah, yeah, this yeah. song? And yeah. then no, it wasn't that. And then finally, he'd settle into something. So. Um, I've actually done the solo thing now um, a few times and done a longer, like, hour set. Really? Really? But I've used that as my model. Do you, do you know many, many vocalists that would do an hour I don't set think solo? So. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah, I don't, I don't think either. so. But I also allow myself to not worry if I did, if pitch did deviate, if I modulated somewhere, whatever, you know. 
I mean, I'm sure if Jackie Byer is playing something and he starts to play How Deep Is the Ocean, he may go off to another key because it's interesting, you know, to him in that moment. So I didn't want to get too rigid about it. I wanted to, to try to feel like the music in me could flow out through sound um, and story. Well, you know what Miles said, and there's no such thing as a wrong note. It's what you do with the note after Exactly. You. <laughs> right. Exactly. How you resolve it. That's in other right. Words. Where it, where it right. leads you. What happens right. next. Right. Um, so it's been really exciting <laughs> to, um, to right. work on this. Really challenging, but um, I've really learned so much. Now, you, uh, oh, a few years ago, you recorded for, I guess it was Novus. And those were, oh, yeah. Those were group. Those are all oh, yeah. group things, and they're very different than the things that you're releasing, uh, you've released recently. Right. Or relatively recently. Right. Yeah. yeah, so so I got the recording contract um, for RCA one probably 1995, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. I was four months pregnant with my first son. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? Really? And Steve Becker went and heard my first record. I'm sorry, my second record that I did for Accurate Records, a, a record called My Resistance is Low. Um, and he called me up and he said, you know, I want to have lunch with you. And um, we were talking and he said, um, even though Entra knew and everybody else, I had sent him the demo, because he'd always been interested in my work, so I had sent him the demo of My Resistance is Low. Um, never heard a thing back from him. So I was like, oh, I, I'm terrible. <laughs> so he takes me out to lunch. He said, you know, we want to sign somebody to RCA, a vocalist, and we've been asking, you know, different musicians and asking people in the club, you know, club owners and stuff. And every, tons of people are saying, you know, check out Dom Dominique's work. And so he went and bought the record by Resistance is Low. Oh, okay. And he looked at me and he said, yeah. you know, I just want you to know it's perfect. And I just had to say, <laughs> I went, but I sent it to you. I was like, nope. I say thank you very much, and so, um, so he signed. You know, he said that they wanted to sign me, and I told him, I said, you know, that's great, but I'm moving back to Boston, and I'm four months pregnant. And he just said, Mazel Tov. You weren't, we weren't in Boston at the time. You no, were? I was living in New York. So from oh, okay. 1990 to 1996, okay, I lived in in New York. So this this was actually you know, like March of '96, something like that. But he was great, Mazel Tov, you know, because I knew it would be an issue, a question how much could I tour, you know, with a, with a young infant. And, um, but it, he was just like, great, go, you know, go do your thing. And so I was working on that first record for RCA um, before and after my son's birth. Went and recorded it, I think, when he was five months old. Um, and I was able to go out with, you know, lots of support from... Baby and you went on the road? And my husband Alan came along for some of it, and then we, we were in Europe, and I have two sisters that live in Europe, so um, they helped out as well. They met me in a couple of places, and you know, sat babysat while I was doing my gigs. So. Uh, uh, check, yeah. check my memory. Were yeah. you born in France? I was born in England, England. but my mother right. was right. Okay. from the French-speaking part of Switzerland. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that's why my two right. sisters, right. two right. of my right. sisters, right. live in in Europe. So, but though, yeah. So there was a budget to do a bigger thing with those records, which was wonderful. And for the first one, um, when the wind, wind was cool, I had been working with, you know, just amazing musicians in New York, so it was a chance for me to get them, uh, many, many of them on board, which was, I was really, really happy to be able to do. So, um, you know, Fred Hirsch played on it, and um, James Chinas, who I had been working with, Peter Leach, the wonderful um, Canadian guitar player who lives in, in New York, um, lots of people. So, so I, and I wrote a lot of, of that music. I knew I couldn't arrange all of it, so I did hire a couple. Um, Philip Johnston um, did, did um, a few of the arrangements, and, but I did a lot of the arranging as well for that. And, the, the second one was a smaller group, kind of more what um, I had been doing up here in Boston with my groups with Donald Brown and John Lockwood and Alan Dawson, right, and, right, um, right, you know, a small yeah. ja jazz right. trio. Yeah. Um, so that was the second one. Yeah. Um, well, now, uh, do you not have any desire to work, to record with a, a trio, a quartet, or sure. something like no, that? No, I do. Um, 
so I did have since then done one of the things I wanted to do was document the work that Rand, and, Rand Blake and I have done. Right, right. So since the RCA records, I've done two records with Rand. Just um, been two? It seems yeah, like it was more than that. I know. It's really only been two. Mm -hmm. um, we did one um, independently, and then we did one for Sunnyside. Um, that's the most recent uh, recording that I've released. And um, that... So I really wanted to do that, and then I also um, recorded with a young piano player named Jed Wilson. Oh, um, maybe that's what I'm uh, yeah. So there, so there's a too. there's three right. jazz releases, which are voice and piano. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I I write for for other ensembles, and I am eager to record with with um, bass and drums at least. How far along in that thought process are you? Are you are you thinking about doing it? Are you looking for a label to sign with? Are you thinking about putting it out on your own? Or I think I'm right now thinking about the right people to do it with, okay. um, and okay. and that will help. A lot of the things I've been writing are almost completed, but I wouldn't probably do the final steps till I knew for sure who I would do that with. So. Um, you know, I do, I'm pretty busy <laughs> between, you know, because I teach full time at New England Conservatory and um, I have been raising two um, wonderful sons. Um, Are they off the, the last, college? Well, you know, it's, it goes on. Yeah, okay. It goes oh, on. It, it goes on. Yeah. That's a nice way of putting it. Everybody knows. <laughs> it's never ending. And uh, <laughs> so, so during this time, you know, since I've been back in Boston, um, you know, once the once I was no longer with RCA after those two records, I've just been taking the work that people have been calling me for. So it's been really lucky that a lot of really interesting work has come along, and and I've been collaborating with with a lot of wonderful people. But I am kind of looking out over the horizon, you know, toward the horizon, thinking, okay, this keeps me busy enough, but what's the next thing that I want to put together myself? So uh -huh. that's where uh -huh. I am. Do you have any issues? With uh, you know, at Terry Lynn Carrington has started this jazz and gender. It's so right. Institute yeah. There. Uh, have you uh, thought about that? How are you? Do you see yourself as being involved uh, in the issue, if not in the, in the program sure. with Terry Lynn? I think it's incredible that they did that. I think it's a lot of vision, and she is an amazing, you know, an amazing person to to be able to be at the hub of that and she's already doing incredible things um, some of my students have been involved with that my students from New England Conservatory have been involved in different ways um, there are you know musical things that go on that that overlap between Berkeley and NEC because of that um, my student Darren Dean who you know a wonderful um, singer mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. LA put a big band together for her senior recital last year that had um, it was all women and it was women from Berkeley and NEC and the greater Boston area um, so I think it it's creating um, this network uh, that was that's there but not Officially, now yeah, it's okay. giving it, you know, okay. this, um, mm -hmm. which I think is amazing, and and also, you know, in the work that I've done, as I was saying, with with the jazz department, because there weren't very many vocalists, there were also not very many women right. or young right. women. Right. Um, right. So that's changed in terms of um, just the demographic of the student body for the jazz department. Um, we do have wonderful male vocalists, but it's much more common to have female vocalists. So. We usually have about 15 or so, I and mean, it's small, but it's a small department, so it's a big percentage um, of, of jazz vocalists. So that changes mm -hmm. that right away. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, I'm not waving a banner at this point or doing something official in that way, but behind the scenes I want to make, I want to increase diversity of all kinds at New England Conservatory and in the workplaces that I'm in. And, um, and empower these amazing young women to do these things right. that, that they can do. I mean, I just, right. one of my students um, from Slovakia had a recital last night, Esther Visnarova. She wrote um, for big band and string quartet, harp, cello. Mm -hmm. um, she conducted and she sang yeah. brilliantly. Mm -hmm. um, so we need more, we need to see that more. Just like when I came to Berkeley, nobody showed me that video of, Blossom Deary playing Surrey with a fringe on top with an impeccable time. You know, nobody nobody showed me, you know, what 
these people were capable of, right, then right. you don't have the role model and you don't dream big, right, right. as big. I mean, right. I did dream big, but we can dream bigger each time. Sure, you sure. know, um, and, and so it just becomes a funny kind of narrow-mindedness that sinks in. So I feel like I'm constantly opening that up, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And it can be sometimes through um, political things, but it can also sometimes be very practical. practical. What is the creative singer doing in this environment, musical environment? And, and sometimes people don't include it when we're talking about jazz programs that won't include voice because they don't know what to do. So if you can say, it doesn't have to do that these strange creatures have come in, these rather <laughs> fragile or dramatic or whatever, you know, these other, right, the right. others have come in and we don't know what to do about it. It's very practical things to, to do. So I've actually written um, something, we may end up publishing it, which is um, titled, the working title is um, integrated, uh, integration of creative singing into ensemble mm. music. Mm. So that people think of all the things that, that an instrument, that a vocalist can do with instrumentalists rather than just be another horn or be that dramatic storyteller. There's everything in between. Everything. We've only got a few minutes left, but I wonder, I, earlier I said uh, we would ask you to mention some of the people that have studied oh, with yeah. you, too. Tell us some of the folks who have studied Okay, so this is going to be off the top of my head, okay. and I'm okay. sure there are people that I'm going to forget, okay. um, but I'll just tick through some of them. So um, I mentioned that I had been in Italy, um, in Europe, with one of my sons when he was born. I was yeah. doing a workshop there where I met Roberta Gambarini. She oh, was a student, sure, sure, and sure. so she came to NEC to do... Um, her artist diploma, um, which she ended up not finishing because she was kind of swept off into you know the next stages of her life, but really enjoyed working with her. Um, Luciana Souza was a student of mine um, at the conservatory. She had gone to Berkeley for four years and you know had come to hear me play and wrote and said, "I want to come to the conservatory and study with you." Um, and at that time were um, Patrice Williamson, Lisa Thorson, and Chris Adams, who are wonderful oh, yeah. vocalists sure, here, sure. and also teachers sure. now at, at Berkeley College of Music. Um, more current students, Joe Lowry, who um, sang um, back up with Sting for about 10 years. Um, she, um, she's on that, mm -hmm. how many of her feet from stardom? <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, uh. And a wonderful singer. She's also recorded with Fred Hirsch. Um, Sophia Ray, R-E-I, oh, sure, Kutsavitas, sure. yeah. uh -huh. who's a wonderful singer from Argentina, an amazing writer. Um, there have been people, um, Michael Mayo, who's an up-and-coming um, vocalist who's incredible. I think he's recording now for Max Jazz. Um, I know I'm forgetting so many people. Non-jazz singers, um, Aoife O'Donovan. Um, who's an Brian O'Donovan's yes, daughter. Yes, Brian O'Donovan's daughter, right. disclaimer. Um, <laughs> but an amazing, amazing <laughs> musician and part of a group called I'm With Her, in which Sarah Jarose, who was also my student, um, is a singer-songwriter and mandolin player. Mm -hmm. um, um, there's a wonderful uh, vocalist in Chicago named Kenya um, Seymour. She often goes just by Kenya. She's played piano and sung backup for No Name. She also sings with Chance, um, and she's done some stuff on her own as well. And, um, so it goes. It, there's it, there's all, a lot of folks. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, folks. a lot of people, and that's just the New England Conserv New England Conservatory people. So I've also, when I was in New York, I had a private teaching studio, and I teach people outside of okay. of NEC as well. Any any uh, performances coming up? Uh, I know the conservatory especially schedules things way out. Uh, yeah, well, actually, there is one that was way out, but it's coming really um, up rather shortly. Um, the jazz department at New England Conservatory is celebrating its 50th anniversary, yeah. so there have been a lot of um, events for that, and the next one that's coming up is some nights at the Jazz Standard. So on... Um, in New York. In New York, yeah. yeah, in New York City. So on uh, Thursday, um, uh, eight, so, 18th, I think it is. Oh, so. Or 19th. It's Thursday, Thursday the 19th. It's all star group with Miguel Zenon and Fred Hirsch and Donnie McCaslin, a bunch of people. The following night, Fred Hirsch and I will be there, uh oh, doing piano and voice duo. <laughs> <laughs> I sense a theme right, here. Right, right. Uh, which I'm so excited about. In fact, I'm going to go down to New York on next Tuesday to um, play with him for WGBO. 
BGO. BGO, thank you. I knew that wasn't right. Um, and then locally, um, I'll be at Indian Hill Music School the end of April, um, and a few other a few other things, and then I'll hopefully be going on a short tour to the West Coast. Okay. Could you could you uh, quickly give us how we can get in touch with uh, tell us how we can get in touch with Dominique uh, social media kind of things? <sighs> well. Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Here's my I don't number. know what that means. <laughs> I'm just not as up to speed as I ought to be, um, but I do have a website, and I try to keep it up to date with the calendar, and now that you've asked me, I'm motivated to do so. I am on Twitter, but I tend to just post pretty pictures that I photograph when I'm out walking. Uh, I, you know, I was thinking the other day, I haven't seen a, a post from Dominique or, or Alan mm. in a while. On Isn't Facebook? It? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I'm on, I mean, I do tend oh, to put my gigs. Okay, uh, that's true. I do do Facebook, but um, I don't know. They're, okay, they're, they're, they're controlling that. Yeah. They don't want you to know about yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> Dominique, thank you very much. Oh, for such a pleasure. Yeah, really, yeah. Eric. Always thank you. To see you Likewise. Okay. My guest has been Dominique Eade today. As I said uh, when I opened, a longtime member of the jazz community, and a pleasure to talk with today, too.